Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all for joining us this morning for a very important and timely discussion, World Peace, Its Impacts and Challenges on Globalization. Uh, as an attorney, um, I deal with a lot of international clients, mm -hmm. and the question I always get is, you know, you form these different agreements and deals, uh, what is the trust factor? I mean, can we trust it? How, how does it hold in the court of law? And so, with so many of those queries coming my way, I decided that this would be a very important topic, especially for the Asian Indian Chamber of Commerce, to assist our members in really dealing with uh, the challenges, the impacts, and finding solutions to these problems and how to address it going forward, especially in this global environment. And I invited two very phenomenal um, speakers this morning, Dr. Subramaniam Swami and uh, Rajiv Malhotra. And I'm going to introduce them and I'll allow them um, you know, to speak about this topic and then we'll make it a very interactive and um, exciting discussion. Open it up to uh, all of you to ask questions and you know, we'll take it from there. Mm -hmm. Our first speaker is Dr. Subramaniam Swami. I'm sure all of you know him. He was born on September 15, 1939 in Chennai, Tamil Nadu, India and is a widely known public figure in India, having been elected member of parliament five times from 1974 to 99, and he has held cabinet positions in the union government twice, first as a minister for commerce, law, and justice, and later as chairman with cabinet rank of the Commission on Labor Standards and International Trade. He also worked as assistant economic affairs officer, United Nations Secretariat, New York in 1963, and as member of India's Planning Commission. Dr. Swami has a long and continuing academic association with the world-famous Harvard University since 1962. He was awarded a doctorate in economics by Harvard degree conferred in 1965 based on his research with two Nobel laureates, Simon Kuznets and Paul A. Samuel Samuelson. Dr. Swami has also jointly authored with Professor Samuelson a path-breaking study on index number theory. Upon completing his PhD, the author joined the Faculty of Economics at Harvard in 1964, and from then on, he has till date taught at the Department of Economics for a total period of about 12 years. From 69 to 1991, Dr. Swami was Professor of Economics at the IIT Delhi from which post he resigned upon becoming the Union Commerce Law and Justice Minister. And he also served on the Board of Governors of the IIT Delhi and on the Council of IITs. He is a prolific writer. Besides numerous articles in journals, periodicals, and newspapers, he is the author of 10 books. He is proficient in many languages, including Mandarin, Chinese, and he has widely regarded as an expert on the economy of China. Dr. Swami is nationally famous in India for his heroic struggle against the authoritarian imposition of emergency. He is respected for pioneering the normalization of relations with China in persuading the Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping in 1981 to open the Kailash Mansarovar pilgrim route in Tibet. He also campaigned for India's recognition of Israel. As Commerce Minister, he prepared the blueprints for economic reform subsequently implemented by the successor, Narasimha Rao, government of which he was also a part of. As Law Minister, he is appreciated for his bold fight against terrorism in South India. He is the President of the Janata Party since 1990, which party was founded by Jay Prakash Narayan in 1977 in the aftermath of the emergency. Dr. Swami is a founding member of the party. He is also chairman, School of Communication and Management Studies in Kerala, and life trustee, Naveen Hindustan Foundation. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, you know, he is just a very phenomenal individual, and I've heard him speak, and you are really going to enjoy this discussion. Our next speaker is Rajiv Malhotra. He is a friend and a wonderful gentleman, and you're going to really enjoy his presentation as well. After many successes in corporate career in the U.S., as well as in entrepreneurship in telecoms, Rajiv Malhotra became a philanthropist and started the Infinity Foundation. He runs this full-time and has exited uh, the for-profit business world. This foundation's vision is to encourage multiculturalism and globalization 
in which non-Western civilizations are given equal respect. Its special focus is on Indian civilization and its geopolitical future. The foundation has given over 300 grants for research and education to major institutions and individual scholars. It has organized several conferences and scholarly events in the US and India, and you can visit his website on www.infinityfoundation.com. Mr. Balotra is also the chairman of the Board of Governors of the Center for Indic Studies, University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. He serves on the board of the New Jersey chapter of the American Red Cross. He was formally appointed by the previously Governor of New Jersey State of the Asian American Commission, where he served as chairman of the Asian Studies Committee. He is a member of the External Advisory Board of Computer Sciences at NJIT and he writes and speaks regularly on a variety of topics concerning the traditions and cultures of India, globalization, and East-West relations. He has been invited to address the World Peace, World Public Forum in Rhodes, Greece in October of 2008. So help me give them a very big round of applause. And I look forward to your discussion. Dr. Srivan and Swami, do you want to get started? Yeah, sure. When you speak here, from here. Wherever you're comfortable. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ms. Seema Singh. Um, I'm much privileged to, to share a platform with uh, Rajiv Malhotra, who uh, you may think of him as a corporate executive, but he is today emerging as uh, India's premier revolutionary historian. Uh, his uh, researches in history are going to be landmark uh, for the future development of a virile Indian identity. And we look forward to his publications, uh, which are due soon. And therefore, uh, to share a platform with him is, a, is also my privilege. I. Uh, would like to speak to you on a different perspective on world peace. I have attended uh, as a minister many conventions on peace and they are very pious uh, where uh, everybody is for peace and uh, everybody wants uh, to have uh, settle everything by discussion etc. but it doesn't go beyond that. I have a slightly dif different approach to this problem and I will uh, place it before you in as brief uh, in a concise way as possible. First of all, world peace and its meaning has been debated many times. The most celebrated uh, discussion I know of is between the former President of the United States, Howard Taft, and the former Secretary of State, uh, William Jennings Bryant which uh, was published in the beginning of the 19th, uh, 20th century and which uh, has uh, gone into great depths as to what are the various dimensions of world peace. Obviously, world peace is, is not absence of war. War can be waged to, to ensure peace and uh, we can say that World War II certainly was a war for peace and it was not a war in that sense and on the other hand the British Prime Minister Mr. Neville Chamberlain's peace at hand resolution and agreement that he signed with Hitler was actually an invitation to war so basically what what has uh, emerged is that appeasement in the process of seeking peace can never ensure peace, nor is it possible that you can achieve peace if you allow countries in the name of peace to enjoy the fruits of aggression. In 1990, uh, Iraq annexed Kuwait and uh, if, if the world had not gone to war at that time, there wouldn't have been peace. Certainly, justice to Kuwait would never have been done. So therefore, I would begin by saying that there cannot be peace unless there is uh, human rights are secured. So the fundamental principle guiding 
whether war is for peace or peace is, is, uh, is stable, is whether the state of human rights is in a, in a healthy state. War in the defense of human rights is, of course, waging for peace. And uh, also today, there are more dim dimensions of that. Gender respect, as we saw uh, in Bosnia, uh, war waged in Bosnia, that was necessary. Today, if you look at the war in Afghanistan as a way of preventing the Taliban from imposing atrocities on the uh, women, then I would say that war could be justified from that angle. And therefore, uh, I would go to say that we have to look at this whole perspective of war and peace as interlinked and that the interlinking is done by various dimensions of human rights. Now, obviously waging a war cannot be an individual country's decision in this globalized world. It has to be by international consensus. It cannot be uh, unilateral. And this principle, ironically, was uh, laid out many years ago, many, many centuries ago, in India, in the great classic, the Mahabharata, where one of the great patriarchs defined the concept of apadharma, which loosely translated means uh, morality in an emergency. Uh, what you do, uh, how moral principles are to be defined when there is a state of emergency. Human, human rights, of course, is not just merely the U, uh, United Nations Charter. There is a charter and the principles initiated there is not only that. I mean, human rights are not confined to that. But I would say that the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which have been framed, in 1966, the International Labor Organization codes on labor standards, the environmental protocol, uh, gender conventions, all these together have to be viewed as part of the human rights uh, framework which the world has to look at. And therefore, any uh, international regulation or sanctions or enforcement which mitigates against the base instincts of the human being, such as genocide, rape, gang rape, or uh, collective rape, slave labor, imperialism, these are all to be treated as violation of human rights, not just the freedom of speech and freedom from arrest, but all these are aspects of human rights. And uh, such regulations, for human rights ought to be enforced by war if necessary. That is, would be the real commitment to world peace. Now, it's quite clear that these commitments cannot be fulfilled unless you have a wide variety of institutions sprouting up. And that includes non-governmental institutions, particularly non-governmental institutions, which are the NGOs who play a vital role in informing world opinion about the true state of affairs in various countries. This, uh, this concept of human rights arises of the fact that human beings are a special species. Human beings can analyze, human, human, human beings can articulate, human beings can invent, human beings can innovate, which other species uh, cannot do. And therefore, uh, we have over history developed civilization for higher values than just mere material comforts or material needs. Arts, music, literature, poetry, and most of all religion are, are the developments of civilization. <coughs> Hence, these pursuits are to not to be derailed and therefore a certain enforcement machinery is necessary. Today, religion has degenerated into fundamentalism and also activities to proselytize around the world. So therefore, we, for world peace, we must now build a religious consensus that 
uh, religious, uh, re uh, religious, re all religions, for instance, the belief which should be adopted by consensus, that all religions, if practiced truthfully and truly, would lead to God. This is, this is much easier said than done. It is not going to be easy for getting this consensus. But I think we must now strive for a, uh, a consensus that there are no chosen people in this world who, whose job is to solicit or convert or kill others because they happen to be pagans or kafirs. In my opinion, therefore, internationally funded and induced religious conversion activities are a threat to world peace. And they should be opposed. They should be stopped by a convention. Today, billions and billions of dollars are being spent for induced conversions in Africa and Asia. And these are, in my opinion, a threat to world peace. To promote world peace, therefore, in my opinion, nations must strive for material progress that is consistent with spiritual advancement. This one-dimensional fixation today that globalization has come to signify that materialism is what has been pursued, a better and more and more production in per se. This, in my opinion, will lead to exploitation and ultimately a threat to world peace through the destabilizing effects of such pursuit of, uh, of uh, uh, materialism. Hence, globalization must be taken now, if it is to be a healthy process, as some as pursuit of economic activities that is harmonious with nature. It should be socially tolerable. In fact, in the search for low cost, and low labor costs. Companies are searching world for where labor legislation doesn't even exist. They can go to Indonesia for this purpose. You can have the situation where China would even use prison labor for producing goods for export. They attempt to go to search for lower and lower costs will lead ultimately to a spiral where it will come down to the very bottom and this would lead to great misery in the world. So globalization has to be made socially tolerable and that socially tolerable uh, parameters have to be worked out. Finally, the globalization today has to be morally adequate. There are many aspects of glo globalization which are highly disruptive, both morally and in, in, uh, in family <coughs> values. Family system today is being threatened to be reduced to a nuclear family. That is the, the, the system in the West. But in Asian countries, families have become shock absorbers for the miseries that one may go through in life without the benefit of social security. So therefore, to disrupt the family system without uh, having an alternative system in place is, in my opinion, morally not tolerable. Certain kinds of diseases today are being <coughs> enabled by free globalization. So therefore, in my opinion, the morally uh, adequate uh, component of globalization is equally important. Hence, I would say that it's not enough for us to develop our cognitive intelligence to find better and better ways of doing things better and better and more productive ways of producing goods and services. <coughs> but we must also develop other components of intelligence which have now been recognized by scholars in this country. One is in emotional intelligence, in how to bond with other people, how to express your emotions in such a way that it leads to the best in the other person. We have a concept of social intelligence where Human beings are made to consider how the society, social benefits and costs, not just private benefits and costs, are maximized. How the environment, for example, is protected is part of the social intelligence of the human being. We must develop moral intelligence, which means
to be able to do su take such actions which promote the human rights, gender equality, and a variety of other things which make the human being a more evolved and better person and a civilized person. And finally, we have to educate our people in the concept of spiritual intelligence, which means the ability to interact with the vast energy of this cosmos and to learn how to draw from that energy. Today, yoga has become extremely popular in this country. But our, our, but our the, the, the spiritual leaders in India know that in terms of uh, in terms of evolving as a human being, you can have a neural, neural Wi-Fi, if I may use that word, to connect with the cosmos in such a way that the energy enables you to think out of the box. That if you do not do that, then you will always remain within the box and uh, given to stale uh, pursuits uh, after a period of time. Human character therefore rests on the foundation of these five dimensional intelligences. Pure development of cognitive intelligence will lead to persons who would become ultimately threats to world peace. And the only way to ensure that human beings evolve is by development of all these five intelligences which will become part of the school curriculum in, in every country. The current threats to world peace rests on entrenched patterns of conflict, of ruthless competition and greed. And that should be replaced by a conscious effort for harmonious accommodation. I'm happy to see after a relentless pursuit of economic growth in China, the Chinese leaders are now talking about a harmonious society. And they say that inequalities will be, become intolerable if we do not develop this concept of harmonious society. This concept of harmonious society has been the spiritual foundation of the religion in India. And we need now to modernize it and look at it in, in modern terms. Mahatma Gandhi had said that the world is enough for everybody's need, but not for everybody's greed. And therefore, we need a new attitude towards consumption, where it is based on need uh, rather than greed. And that is the way to make globalization work. Otherwise, the present one-dimensional pursuit of materialism and globalization would lead to ultimately to war. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll now hear from our next speaker, um, Mr. Rajiv Malhotra. Thank you, Seema, for inviting me. It's an honor to be here. And I'm delighted to share the podium with my friend, Dr. Suramani Swami. We've uh, been on panels before, and it's always been a delight. Uh, if medical a medical doctor has not succeeded in curing a patient, then it makes sense to question whether the diagnosis was correct. You have to go back to step back and ask whether you're pursuing it in the correct framework. The idea of world peace has been pursued for a very long time, but we haven't produced the breakthrough results that people had hoped for. So proclamations, declarations, let's have a petition, let's all hold hands and stuff like that has not really worked. Uh, so I think the time has come to say things which may be politically incorrect, but which need to be said, which have been not easy to say, but need to be said. So I'll make an attempt to do that. I spent the last dozen years full-time pursuing certain areas of inquiry for myself. And this has both a bottom-up grassroots dimension and a top-down uh, intellectual thinking and research and going to a conferences dimension. The bottom-up dimension basically started with work in the rural areas in India for humanitarian things, for helping people with their AIDS people, tsunami people, various educational projects. Started out mostly as a humanitarian thing, but my interest was to understand their culture, to understand what was, the, what was going on in their society, in their identity, religion, 
and through that began to understand what were the problems, why was there conflict in the grassroots of society, especially in India. Based on that, I developed a framework on the role of religion in conflict. And that's one of the pathologies that has not been adequately understood because it's easier to sort of cover it up and say, you know, we're all the same and we should just forget issues. But if it were that simple, we would have solved these problems because they've been around for a long time. So one of the, one of the issues that I'd like to comment on is the role of religion uh, and give you my analysis as to why this is a serious problem and not as easy as uh, it might seem. Second uh, issue I uncovered, which uh, also working in the grassroots, is the ethnic conflict, uh, especially this whole idea of Dravidianizing versus Aryanizing, which is a colonial construction, and then Dalitizing, and so on. Um, this is not religion, but this is a different kind of an identity based on a false idea of history. So history was fabricated, history was made to create these conflicting identities since colonial times, and entirely new identities like Aryan, which never existed, and Dravidian never existed in the Tamil classics until 150, 200 years ago. These were constructed, and these are what we are living with today. And I'll also talk about the role of the United States, which may surprise some of you, the role of the United States in actually uh, creating some of these problems or, or not creating them since they had been created during British times, but making them worse. And this involves the role of the church in, in ex exploiting these differences, the role of certain think tanks in this country, the role of the federal government also. Uh, and in fact, I'm writing a book on uh, the role of the Western nexus in uh, creating violence in South India, where I feel that the violence will get worse and become like Northeast of India within the next 10 years. So I'll, I'll talk about that. So these are the two uh, bottom-up uh, issues of uh, violence that I want to discuss. And then there's a, there's a top-down, more global view. And that has to do with uh, competition, uh, is, uh, com civilizational competition uh, to the Western worldview, the Western idea of enlightenment as a paradigm, uh, what we call secularism, as a paradigm that uh, claims to be universal is now being challenged not only by Islam, uh, but also by China. China has its own model, which they call the Confucian model. And they, they claim that the Confucian model, the Confucian ethics, the Confucian science, Confucian modernity is an alternative way of looking at the world. And that's a, that's, we have to understand it because it's, it's there and it will be there. And then I conclude by uh, making some comments on uh, what we mean by liberalism, because often a reaction to all this is that this is all sort of uh, conservative problems, but we don't have it because I'm a liberal. A lot of people will say that. And I will challenge the liberals uh, as to whether they're liberal enough. I will, I will classify liberals and, and uh, concede that they are liberal up to a certain point, but I will define a higher standard of liberal, and then I will see if uh, people are willing to sign up for that. Uh, and then I talk about uh, Obama, because you have to say something about the politics also. Yeah? So that's my, I just have some notes, and, and uh, I'll, I'll try to sum up all this. Now, <coughs> the word religious tolerance is big word. I claim that tolerance is not good enough. What we need is mutual respect. Tolerance, tolerance means that, uh, you know, Sort of like, I tolerate you to sit next to me. It's an insult. I mean, if Seema were to say, I tolerate you to come and speak, I would say, thank you. Or imagine your spouse saying, I tolerate you in the house. Or you know, imagine you're invited to a dinner and somebody says, you know, I tolerate you to eat dinner next to me. And yet, we get away with this. We, we think it's a big deal. It's a big favor to me if somebody says, I tolerate religious tolerance. I offer you religious tolerance. I think it's not good enough. About two months ago, I was interviewed by a local uh, group called uh, Fellowship in Prayer, They're based in Princeton. And I've known this group for a long time, and I've worked with them in the past. So this new director came to see me and was interviewing me for her issue, next issue of her magazine. So I asked her, what is your position 
on non judeo Christian religions. And she said, uh, we believe in tolerance. So I gave her this idea that, you know, would you like it if I say I tolerate you to interview me or all that. So she kind of got the point. And she said, oh, this is a very, very interesting point. Can I quote you and do this in my next issue? So I said, yeah. But when you say, say that you now think mutual respect is the way to go, I want you to explain to your readers what mutual respect entails, because it's not just language, it's not just change in semantics. When you respect me, make sure you tell them that I worship images, even though you're told that idolatry is bad, but I worship images. I worship images. I worship the divine as feminine. You may think God is male. I worship divine as feminine. Yeah? I believe in reincarnation. You may think there's heaven and hell. So I'm giving you three examples right there of what is entailed by respecting me. Yeah? You can tolerate a heathen, pagan, kafir, he's no good, he's going to hell, but we are good, we will tolerate him. You can tolerate that which you dismiss. But if you respect, you kind of legitimize them. You legitimize them. So when, you, when your readers offer me respect instead of just tolerance, please explain to them that they'll be respecting these aspects of my faith and then they have to deal with what what happens to their own covenants and what their own commandments are asking for. They have that issue to deal with. And I'm not making it easy on you to respect me. But I'm asking you to respect me. So please mention that to your readers. So she wrote a very nice editorial. Then she called me next day and she said, you know, it's not so easy to talk about mutual respect. <laughs> so there's a lot of hypocrisy in this uh, interfaith dialogue going on, where everybody talks about <coughs> tolerance. So the one thing I want to, my first point for you is, anytime you meet somebody who says interfaith dialogue, tolerance, talk about mutual respect, some of them will back off right then. Some of them will go for it, which is good. You get them first, you get them in the door, and you get them committed to this idea of mutual respect. And once they're committed to mutual respect out of uh, political correctness, because it's a nice thing to say, then you start explaining, but you know, you are respecting me for worshipping my images. And then they suddenly get a little concerned. And then you say, you know, but I also worship the divine as the feminine. They get even more concerned. Because now there's some, some, there's something that they have been told that you can't really uh, accept at all. I was interviewed uh, by a radio station in Dallas uh, uh, several months ago. And uh, it was a South Asian radio station, and they said we're very liberal, we're very broad-minded, and, and you know, uh, we're all into harmony and all that stuff. So uh, one of the women who called in, is a talking call-in show, so this is a Pakistani uh, Muslim leader. I had been told that she always calls in and so on, so I was ready for it. But she called in and said, I'm so happy to hear you talk about mutual respect, Rajiv ji, on behalf of the Muslim community, we offer mutual respect to everybody and we are so happy. So I said, okay, now let me test this. I worship images and you are told not to worship images, in fact, to smash people's images, other people's images. And I worship the divine as feminine and so on. So I went through my whole list of what respecting me entails. She hung up. <laughs> Because, because it's not, when you push the envelope towards the truth, to, towards what you're really talking about, what would really bring about harmony, you know, then, then this facade of correctness goes away. If you don't push hard enough because you're concerned and afraid, you know, you can keep talking about uh, tolerance all day long, nothing will change. So you have to ask for mutual respect. And the way I can ask for mutual respect is I offer it to you. I offer you, I respect you for whatever your faith is, whatever you believe. You worship the tree, you worship this particular idea of God or that prophet or son of God. I respect you for that while I'm very secure in what my own faith is and I demand the same respect in return. That is what I demand. So this is a very big deal, this shift and I've been to many uh, uh, interfaith conferences and become the spoiler simply by saying I, I would like the resolution to change, the resolution which calls for tolerance, I would like to scratch that off and put mutual respect and here is what it means. Uh, and then the whole thing falls apart. The whole discussion goes haywire because people are not willing to do that. You may think 
It's only a change in semantics. Actually, when you explain what is entailed, it's a very, very big deal for them to do that. So please uh, try it out when you, when you meet with people. Now, why is respect for difference such a difficult thing? This is the next issue. It has to do with the claim of exclusivity. The claim which says, for my faith to be valid, anything else has to be invalidated, because otherwise it threatens my faith. This claim of, of exclusivity is based on the idea of a unique history that I have to believe in. A unique historical event happened in a certain time and in a certain place, which will never happen again, which never happened to any other people anywhere else in the world. And, it, and I am the custodian, my institution is the custodian and the keeper of that historical event. So this, the uniqueness of history, of, uh, of some idea or some encounter that God had through a son or a prophet or whatever, that becomes non-negotiable. Because if I, if I adapt that or turn it into something symbolic and metaphorical but not literal, then I'm told by my orthodoxy that I'm not being true to my faith. And if I have to be true to my faith, then this history cannot be uh, or superseded by anything else. And therefore, you have a non-negotiable uh, kind of situation that you're starting with. If you have two parties that are disagreeing and you negotiate, you have to have a lot of give and take. I mean, you, you all know that. But if I start with the position that says that there's a certain core claim, I mean, I can negotiate that I tolerate you, that all people are equal, we all love you, there's one God, all those simple things we can agree on. But there's a certain history, there's a certain history that happened, and this history is unique and absolute and universal, and it must be uh, put on, it put, uh, uh, put into everybody's head, everybody should be uh, made to believe in it, and that history is not negotiable. If you start with that, and then the other guy has a different account of history, which is in contradiction with this, you have an irreconcilable <coughs> situation. I won't. I don't have the time, but at some point, if there's Q and A, I can give you why the historical claims of Islam cannot accept the uh, fundamental claims of Christianity, which make Christianity a distinct religion, and conversely, why the historical claims of Christianity, for Christianity to be, to be valid, cannot accept the claim of the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad in the sense that the <coughs> Muslims need, need to be recognized. So these two faiths are uh, really at the climax of such a history-based conflict. It's a conflict based on history. There is not a disagreement on, you know, we should love each other and there should be harmony and we should be fair and all that. There is no disagreement on that. But on the historicity, there is irreconcilable difference. And if that were such a simple matter to solve, they would have solved it in the past thousand years, but they haven't. So this idea of being fixation, fixated on history is a very serious problem that I want to uh, discuss later if people are interested. Now let's set religion aside. Uh, the second area of conflict is a non-religion based ethnic identity, which is also something that has been f largely constructed for political purposes and then these identities have been made to conflict, conflict with each other because a given identity has been told that you are the victims of these other guys. Your history tells you that you, they've always been the bad guys and so your job is to fight them and the reason you're poor or sick or you have some problems is all everything is blamed on those guys. There is some other people on whom it is blamed. And the, I'm the political vote bank leader and I'll save you and I'll champion you. This kind of a fragmentation based on selling people a history which creates an identity, which creates conflict. This is very common. And the origin of this is a very interesting origin. How the discourse starts in one part of the world and it destroys another part of the world. I'll give you a very, very interesting example. In the late 1700s, Germans didn't have a sense of national pride and they discovered Sanskrit and its closeness to German and used it to create the sense of an Aryan identity for themselves. And this created a mirror image of the Dravidian identity 
which is now the whole divisiveness in South India. So this is where it starts and where it ends. Now, why was it so important for the Germans to create this Aryan identity? It's a very interesting reason. The French were their competitors, the English were their competitors, the other Europeans already had a grand sense of historical uh, place. The French said they are the successors to the Renaissance. So the French Renaissance uh, artists and poets and writers and philosophers, they had a claim to history and that's what they taught their children. It's all about teaching your children how great we are. It's all, it's all about that. And that's how the school textbooks are in the United States. That's how the school textbooks were in France. That we are these great uh, the successors of the Renaissance. Uh, the English had their textbooks teaching that we are the keepers of the British Empire. So we are the great people. We own the British Empire. So it's a sense of greatness. The Italians were the, uh, their antiquity was the Roman Empire. So they're great. They can talk about it. The Spaniards had the Spanish Empire. Portuguese had the Portuguese Empire in you know Latin America and Africa and all that. So the major group in Europe which felt that they were sort of like the uh, they were the bad guys, they were the ruffians, they were uh, you know they were uh, uh, what was the name for them? The, uh, the, the Vikings. The Vikings were from the north, but the the uh, um, no no no. no. There's a very common name today, Barbarians. Barbarians. The official name, official name for Germans by other Europeans and by themselves was Barbarians. That was the idea. So the discovery, the discovery that, you know, this great tradition of Sanskrit, this great texts and what lofty stuff in it, and gosh, it is closest to German of all, was a very big deal. So this ignited 50 years of Sanskrit studies across German universities. Every major university in <coughs> Germany from 1800 to 1850 had a very large department of Sanskrit studies, often bigger than Latin, Greek, and all of that. Because this became us. We are that. Because we've discovered this closeness. So this idea of there must be an Aryan people who came up with all this. And gosh, those must be us, you know. Must be us only. We are, after all, Germans. So this was a project to create a German identity to compete with other European identities and was not something intended to be exported to India and create all kinds of havoc which is creating in India today. So it started like that in the early 1800s. And then the British took this Aryanness, and their way of projecting into India was to divide up India. So this idea that the British uh, started rationalizing that, you know, we, the British, are the second Aryan invasion. There was already one Aryan invasion, and that Aryan invasion came, and they brought a lot of uh, Sanskrit here. They did good things, they civilized them, they brought them their Vedas, they brought them Sanskrit, they brought them philosophy. And so that was the first Aryan invasion. And in between all these bad guys, the Muslims came and all of them, and now we are, this is the second Aryan invasion, we are going to complete the civilization mission that we started. So it was kind of like, we are here, good news, you know, we are here, we are Aryans back, you know, we got out, we're coming back again. So this business of uh, the Aryan identity being a foreign identity being brought into India, which the Germans started, the British continued, with, they used it in their own sense. And while one group of British in the North India were promoting this Aryanness, another group of British missionaries led by Robert Caldwell in South India was promoting Dravidian identity. Now it's very interesting that the Tamil classics, which are more than 2,000 years old, do not have an anti-Aryan, anti-Brahmanical, anti-North Indian flavor. They just don't have it. So this was created starting in the 1820s, 1830s by <coughs> colonial missionaries who started looking at the South Indian languages, trying to show that they are very uh, different from the North Indian languages, started creating a sense of history that said that this is, you guys have been victims of the North Indians, started creating a new religion out of the Shaivism, the Tamil Shaivism, saying that this is really not Hinduism, this is something different. So this whole fabrication of the Dravidian in South India was a antithesis or, or, or antagonistic to the Aryan idea which had been created. So both this pair, Aryan and Dravidian, were created. Were created by scholars. And, it was, and a lot of times people say, well, what's the relevance of all this you're studying? What's the relevance to the real world? When I tell him that, you know, what the, what the Indologists started in Europe is now the cutting edge political 
claim, a clash in South India. That is what's about to tear up the country. And it was just a fabricated identity brought to India, which the Indians have accepted. So the movements of, why is there a civil war in, in Sri Lanka? Uh, the, the, at the same time, this Aryan Dravidian divide uh, convinced people that in Sri Lanka, that the Sinhalese are Aryans and the Tamilians are Dravidians. And this origin of the Sri Lankan uh, civil war is also this Aryan Dravidian divide. And so now we are having uh, uh, this problem in South India, which I'm going to discuss in a book I'm doing, that now this uh, American churches have appropriated this Dravidian identity as a way of, let, of breaking, of, create, of converting people to Christianity by saying that, that the Aryans, the bad guys, are Hindus and you guys were not, they imposed it on you, so you should desanskritize, get rid of Sanskrit names, and get rid of anything that, that reminds you of, uh, of these kinds of religions. So uh, sort of uh, uh, the Christianity's evangelists are using this Aryan Dravidian divide as a way to create a Hindu-Christian divide. They're mapping the Aryan Dravidian onto Hindu-Christian respectively. So this first wave was done by the British to create a Dravidian identity which was purely, uh, purely ethnic and, and now the second wave is being led by American evangelists to take this ethnic identity and to Christianize it and turn it into religious conflict. So the uh, number of uh, churches being planted uh, is the largest in the world in Tamil Nadu. They're very proud all kind of uh, groups are involved in that. The State Department has plans there in the name of human rights. Now human rights is a very tricky thing. Because it's a question of which, whose human rights and what's your idea of human rights. So the human rights that's being championed is to say that you guys are victims of the Indian nation state. And the Indian nation state is an oppressor. And, and you should revolt against the Indian nation state. And this uh, in the name of youth empowerment, women's empowerment, Dalit empowerment has become a very big movement across uh, Tamil Nadu and now Andhra Pradesh also. So this is the role of history, fabrication of history. Why history needs to be corrected? Because this manipulative approach to history, starting in one part of the world, exporting to another part of the world, then creating a whole lot of conflict is a cause that we have to come to terms with. This also caused problems in Darfur, Rwanda, all those you can trace back to conflicting identities brought in from outside uh, and engineered while the local people, well, they had fights, but they didn't have such a heavy, heavy duty identity clash like they now do. Yeah. So this is the second issue. So I want to here talk about what is a, who is a minority? You know, if you ask a person, they'll say uh, uh, a group that's small in number and not uh, with enough uh, political power uh, is a minority. Question I ask is in global, in the global era. Do you look at the local census and say that somebody is a minority? Or do you look at them numerically and politically and economically in the global census and see if they are a minority? You'll get different results. You'll get different results. The Nagas are a minority officially in India. But 97 or 8 percent of them are, Bat are Christians and mostly Southern Baptists. Controlled and driven by Billy Graham's church in Texas, which has officially stated that it wants Nagaland to become a separate country and partition out of India. That's in Billy Graham's autobiography. One of, his, one of the things he regrets he may not live to see is the independence of Nagaland. Now, when the world's, one of the most powerful groups in the world, which is the Southern Baptist Church, appropriates this so-called minority and turns them into their branch office and operates them like, you know, Microsoft has a branch office somewhere or IBM has a branch office somewhere, then is that really a minority or is that the branch office of a majority? And it's a very interesting point. If you were to go to a, a place in uh, India and see a McDonald's, would you say it's a minority just because there are 20 people working there? Or would you say that it's a branch of a dominant world majority? Similarly, if you see a Southern Baptist Church in Nagaland, is that a minority? 
or should we consider the Southern Baptist Church to be a multinational? It's a multinational. So just like you have laws on multinationals and you're saying, well, you know, Microsoft's a multinational, and IBM's a multinational, and even if they have 50 employees somewhere, they're working for a big multinational. It's not a minority. The same way if you were to apply the same laws of disclosure and transparency on religions that are multinationals, then you would have to question whether the Nagas are really minorities. And you would have to do the same thing for a whole lot of the so-called minority churches that are all over South India now that are enjoying minority status, but they're really not minorities in a globalized sense. So that's a, that's a provocative redefinition that I'm proposing. The third topic, uh, which I'll talk very briefly because I, we should have more time for discussion. Uh, I was recently at the uh, World Public Forum in uh, Greece, which is, the, uh, which is kind of a counterbalance to Davos. The feeling is that Davos is too much America-centric. Uh, the American government and multinationals kind of dominate Davos. So the idea is that uh, the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians, French, Brazilians, you know, people from India they want also, <coughs> got together and Russia and China put a lot of money and they created this uh, competing organization called the World Public Forum in, which meets uh, in Greece. And, and Moscow and Vienna and now they want to set up something in Washington also. So their discourse is very interesting because it's, it's the sort of stuff you don't hear in the United States, which is why I went there, because I, I, I thought that in this uh, crisis that the world is facing, sitting here in the U.S. we're getting a whole lot of information filtered through U.S. media and U.S. ways of thinking, and it's time to get out of here and physically see what are other people thinking. So next year I'm going to Beijing to attend one of these things because I, it's very important for me to get multipolar views and not just American view and Indian view. Now it's, it's the Chinese at this World Public Forum conducted a three-day workshop parallel while the whole thing was going on. One track was Confucian civilization and its relevance for globalization. Very interesting. They are not in, they are not willing to accept. They made very clear. They do not consider the Western model of globalization to be the only model or the best model. They do not think it is a universally applicable model. It's a model they feel which is inherently biased and tilted in favor of the West. And therefore, while, while China has taken all the technology it wants from whoever it can and believes in world trade and believes in selling its goods to the West, but its social civilizational uh, model it says is called the Confucian ethic and there was a seminar on Protestant ethic versus Confucian ethic very interesting and there is a professor in Harvard uh, two women uh, in, in one of the uh, chairs he has and he's in Beijing also in a big way uh, the Chinese government have, have created this idea that there is a the the Chinese alternative to uh, Western Enlightenment is the Confucian model under which you can be scientific, rational, you can have world order, they have a, their own idea of human rights, their own approach to solving religious conflict, uh, their approach towards environment. And so they were conducting these workshops to put on the table an alternative to the Western approach to globalization. So when we talk about globalization, we also have, we tend to, believe, we tend to assume that it's Westernization. <coughs> We just tend to assume that globalization means, you know, uh, Coca-Cola and McDonald's and stuff like that. And I just want to suggest to you that there's at least two claims to uh, to have an alternative globalization. One is the pan-Islam, which says that they have a model of the way the world should be. Uh, whether you like it or not, it's here to stay. It's not going to go away in the foreseeable future. So that's a globalization model. It's a model of how the world should be. And, the China, and you may say, well, that's kind of uh, going back, back in time because they are against modernity and against science and all that. But then you can't dismiss the Chinese claim of uh, their model of globalization because it's not going back in time. It, it has all the things that the West has, but they think that they've taken the best that the West has to offer on their own terms, put it into the Confucian model, and now they're going to compete and they're going to be number one. So I think that the real competing model of globalization that will challenge the West will be the Chinese model because they have the money, the power, 
and now they are they are saying it's not enough to have all those things we also need to have a civilizational model to compete so that this this is very uh, interesting and this is where indians get very embarrassed uh, i was uh, i asked there five or six people who were from india what do you think what's the indian globalization model you are very embarrassed oh, no 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 we secular we, we we don't talk about these things in the very scared they've got this complex they can't talk about it chinese are very clear very decisive they say we have a we have our model which is 5000 years old then how can you call us chauvinistic and nationalistic and all of that stuff why don't you call the west that uh, they are promoting their model we have a model and so the chinese have this very uh, you know now they've started a 100 Confucian institutes around the world, and, and uh, they have a few of them in the United States. But in many countries, they have the Chinese government and Chinese industry. They come together and they endow a Confucian, an institute for Confucian studies. They usually put it in a university, and they start producing papers and writing, doing courses on the Confucian approach to things <coughs> around the world. So it is not uh, anti-technology and science and modernity like the Islamic. model of globalization it's very much a progressive one but a, an alternative to the west so this this is uh, an era of competing globalizations competing globalizations it's not one globalization model you have to be clear on that even the western model has the the christ jure the christian globalization and the enlightenment globalization are two different models the christian globalization basically says this we are going to have the end of times and uh, jesus will come and then those who are saved will be taken in a spaceship somewhere and those who are not will be killed in a very horrific way and that is what this apocalyptic all these movies and all these books this best sellers are all about and this is a global model and our job is we are running against time because we are running out of time so we have to go and quickly get as many people on board as possible and uh, uh we have to and the, the 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 whole conflict in the middle east is because you know we are we are we have not done our job of restoring the kingdom of israel to its previous map the way it used to be and to restore the kingdom of israel to its previous map requires uh, taking over some territories which the muslims have so these are not very easy problems to solve and this is a globalization model of uh, zionism christian zionism and judeo christianity in general which occupies a very large percent of uh, votes in this country it is not just red states it's also a uh, large number of people are crypto closet thinkers of that kind and so they'll write a check to save a child in india because he's a heathen and he needs to be saved and stuff like that so this is a model of globalization competing within the west against the enlightenment model and while in europe while in europe the enlightenment beat out the christianity big time and and now christianity is trying to come back but for the last 100 years or 200 years uh they've been more into a secular mode and christianity is sort of in the back but the same never happened in the united states uh, and a lot of people think that uh, the recent uh, uh, excesses of uh, christianity are somehow george bush's fault but it is not george bush's fault uh jimmy carter in his autobiography says he's an evangelist He, he made his policies did not tell people at the time because it wouldn't be correct but he made his policies based on his christian ideals and what would jesus say jimmy carter a very liberal man uh, believed in his uh, he, in global evangelism uh, bill clinton throughout bill clinton that is when some of the most uh, uh, christian globalization oriented legislations were passed the international religious freedom and the us commission on religious freedom all these institutions uh, which are holding hearings all over the world when they think something is not in christian interest they have a hearing there these are all enacted during clinton's era so while a person could be a democrat and he could be liberal in some ways uh, this idea of uh, privileging judeo christianity even as a foreign policy it really deep down in the in the politics of this country and this started in the first world war when the churches became very active to to uh, try and project uh, foreign policy so that's the 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 competing globalizations is the is the third point i'll just conclude with uh, liberalism uh, and i touched upon it a little bit already the first uh, first idea of liberalism in america was economic egalitarianism that's what it was 
economic egalitarianism. It was not racial egalitarianism, and it was not religious egalitarianism, but only economic egalitarianism. In fact, Tom, uh, Thomas Jefferson, who said all men are created equal, had 250 slaves. But he said all men are created equal. So his idea of equality didn't apply to everybody, it applied to certain people. And therefore, it was a redistribution of pie, economic pie, but for our whites. That's how the first model of liberalization was. And to be a liberal meant, you know, economically you're favoring the labor union over the capitalists and stuff like that. But it didn't mean that uh, you're, you, you espouse racial equality. Then came the second model of liberalization when racial equality also became an important part of being a liberal. And that is the model which is now winning, that we need economic parity, uh, so we need to help poor people and redistribute the wealth, but we also need racial parity. This is, this is what liberaliz liberalization or liberalism means right now. But the true equality of religions has still not become part of what you are, what a liberal is really supposed to uh, espouse. Tolerance, yes, but I already explained that tolerance is not good enough. And liberals will tolerate other religions, but still it's okay on television on Sundays to condemn the heathens and they go to hell and those, and you know, you watch Sunday television. That is allowed in the public square. But similar condemnation of another race is not allowed. It's not okay. So we made a lot of progress, thankfully, in the area of religious, of uh, racial parity. At least we talk about it, and we are also doing a lot about it. We have not made comparable uh, progress in in espousing uh, religious <coughs> equality and religious parity. So that is the next frontier of uh, liberals. I think I'll stop, and we can have more discussion later. Thank you very much. We're going to open it up for um, a discussion. Anybody has questions and answers? I'm going to start with one question. I had a client walk in who was very frustrated with business he had done in China. His agreement all fell apart. And he came and suggested we should have some international uh, business code of ethics where you know people sign these agreements and they should be um, held to, you know, to abide by it. And I heard uh, Rajiv talk about provocative uh, redefinitions and you know, social norms that uh, Dr. Subramanian Swami mentioned, and also the different <coughs> models. I mean, how possible is it? I know it's going to be a tough road ahead, but any solutions, what we can offer our, you know, our clients in this business environment? <coughs> well, normally when the contract is not uh, complied with, the, the country's judiciary is supposed to provide you uh, relief, and it's a democratic country. Uh, then uh, uh, that's possible. The problem with China is if you know the right people, then you get justice. If you don't know, then uh, you don't. So when the person went in, he should have known that, and now for him to complain is not justified. <coughs> there are agreements in place. However, when you, you know, you're cross country globally, he felt there should be some kind of an international code of ethics. How do you enforce you can, it? Exactly, that's, and that's the issue. So and that's why you open it up. Tell him to concentrate on democratic countries in future. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can have a, uh, an agreement uh, uh, under a certain jurisdiction's law. You can have that. Uh, and you can say this is under such and such country's law, not necessarily the law of that where you're doing business. You can get a judgment there also, but you can't enforce it. And I uh, used to own, have businesses in all these very kind of countries, and I ran into this all the time. And sometimes the U.S. has a fair trade agreement with them. So I was, uh, I had a very serious problem in uh, one of these East European countries, uh, which was one of the reasons I got so frustrated and just left. And the, I was obviously being prejudiced by that country. And I took it to the State Department, who had a treaty with that country. I took it to my lo local New Jersey senator at the time. I tried to get all the help from the United States to enforce its treaty against that country, with that country, okay, which was like a clear case. And it became a matter of the State Department doesn't want to, doesn't have enough resources to back everybody. They backed uh, uh, this uh, Estee Lauder's son, uh, what's his name, the guy who runs, uh, who's a successor to Estee Lauder. 
he had a he had a uh, conflict in the same country. They backed him, and he got a several hundred millions of dollars settlement. But I was not a big fry; I was a small fry. I didn't have the lobbying power, but with my senator, with the State Department, they would listen to me, they were very polite, they were very nice, they would give me all these nice psychological hugs and all that, but they would not have, and the U.S. ambassador there wrote letters saying, this guy is right, you're prejudiced, you're violating the law, but the United States government was not willing to have a small businessman, because I didn't have the clout, which uh, his name was, I've gotten, Ronald Lauder. If you search Ronald Lauder, he settled in Czech Republic, uh, a, a case because he was uh, his rights were violated, and I had the worst violation that I had, far better documented. But they would not. The United States government would not tell me. Yeah. That, that, that was exactly the issue. Yeah. That you know you could have all the agreements in place, just like attorneys and doctors have their code of ethics they have to comply by, despite any agreement. I think. I would urge both of you to revisit that. No, no, I, I think, think, it, I, code of ethics I, I think it is, should be part of this business model and uh, this risk should be included as transaction cost. Uh, and okay. he should maximize his profit subject to that transaction cost. Do you have a question? Uh, I enjoyed uh, listening to very thoughtful insights on uh, all those issues. I'm Sharon Kapalvia, professor from Long Island University. Uh, you said that globalization will lead to spread of miseries around the world. Probably you're talking about a social landscape. Yeah, not only. Uh, but I have a different take on globalization. Globalization will lead to spread of economic prosperity all around the world. And uh, with economic prosperity, what happens is uh, it will lead to substantial reduction in conflicts across the world. Because when you are unemployed or underemployed, that's when the wars and the conflicts start. And look at what will happen around, among the national governments. National governments will start reducing their defense budget tremendously and probably use those budgets and those financial resources on economic prosperity throughout the world. The trick is all of us have to start thinking sooner or later as world citizens rather than national citizens. So, so my question is, globalization should help not in the spread well, of miseries, but probably will help in economic prosperity and prosperity all around. Yeah, but what I said was something different. I said uh, globalization, uh, we should attempt to see that it's made as economically harmonious as possible. And uh, greed should not have a place in the uh, economic uh, pursuit. And that while doing that, you should also see that globalization becomes socially uh, tolerable because you can always have impoverishment of the uh, uh, of the labor force in a country because there is a relentless uh, pursuit for lower costs as part of globalization. And uh, for example, uh, the demand for child labor in India has vastly increased because of the globalization. Now that's not something that we want. So I'm not against globalization, I certainly think globalization is inevitable because the communication technology, the internet and so on have now made it uh, impossible for reversal and going back to the old autarchic systems. But having said that, we need therefore to see that the globalization is done in such a way that it becomes economically harmonious, it becomes socially more tolerable and morally adequate. And there are uh, dangers in all that aspects. After all, take this hot money which is uh, wrecking economies all over the world. Uh, we need some, some regulation to see that hot money doesn't travel the way it does. Uh, there must be, ought to be some restrictions uh, placed on that. Similarly, uh, this new instruments uh, like securitized mortgages and so on, if they start coming, uh, the kind of financial crisis you are seeing in the United States today, subject I mean, without any new financial reforms, will be re repeated, repeated all over the world. And already, because the uh, India created a derivative called participatory notes, which is unprecedented, uh, because you don't have to declare who owns that participatory note, you don't have to declare where the money came from. 
uh, it's almost as good as currency. It's obviously created for enabling politicians uh, with the unaccounted money within the country to send out the money uh, on Havala and then uh, earn uh, in the stock market on that uh, by bringing it back as participatory notes. Now, in the last uh, three weeks, uh, 60 billion dollars have just disappeared from, uh, from India and uh, so the dollar is depreciating in many countries because now there's a turnaround but in India it has been the last two months uh, appreciating it's one of the few countries where the dollar has been appreciating so I'm not talking in terms of banning anything, stopping anything I'm talking in terms of regulation which is a part and parcel of competitive market economy I think one, one of the, uh, there's a difference between we desire something that we are all the same, there shouldn't be these boundaries and there should be, you know, humanity, fairness and all that. But what we desire is not necessarily what uh, what is happening. So what is happening is a lot of globalizations. There's a globalization of terrorism. That's a globalization. There's a globalization of AIDS. The the virus is globalizing. It can travel more than it could. That's what I mean by morally I yeah. So there's a there's a there are many globalizations going on. There's a there's a uh, Christian evangelical globalization going on. So there's many kinds of globalization. I think the way to think of globalization is to think of it as a new playing field in which many forces, competing forces, which were previously isolated are now competing. Everybody wants to globalize. There is a globalized uh, Mathur community meeting that happens once a year. <laughs> they, bring, uh, they bring some five, ten thousand people. There's a Telugu globalization. So there's a Patel globalization. There's all kinds of globalization going on. So is that more ethnic or less ethnic if there's a globalization of individual identities, now they can globalize themselves, you see. So I don't think it's uh, doing away with identity. I think in the global era, you will also see more identities as a way of gaining together to compete for scarce resources with other people. So this is another uh, force, another side of the globalization that will intensify conflicts. Because as human population grows from six and a half billion to nine billion by the middle of this century, and resources become scarce, uh, there'll be more economic conflicts. And one of the uh, rising tides will be politicians catering to a certain identity to give them an, uh, an edge over other identities. And they will use globalization also in their particular way. But wouldn't MNCs be essentially running the show of the world now? Now the politicians would have much little say, very little say. Well, there is a there is a Al Qaeda MNC, there is a there is a Mormon there is a there is a LTT MNC, there is a Mormon Church MNC, there is a there is a Vatican MNC. Vatican is the is the soft power arm of the Italian uh, nation. I mean, Italy didn't Rome is no longer a world power unless you see Vatican as their world power operation. Now it's even better than an MNC because. Being religious, they don't have to be. They don't have to file with the SEC their financial transparency. You cannot get the assets of the Vatican like you can of Pepsi Cola. You cannot find out where the money comes from, where it goes. The number of salesmen they hire is more than any sales force in the world. The number of their collections is more than the revenue of the of Fortune 10, 20 combined. But that MNC is not even under the transparency, not even in the radar, and no one dare question it. And when they appoint, when Pepsi Cola appoints a CEO, he reports to the headquarters, there's a lot of scrutiny by the nation. When a government, United States, appoints a consulate, there's a lot of scrutiny against, uh, uh, with respect to what that guy can do in that foreign country. But when the Vatican appoints a bishop who they fund, who is loyal to them, whose career depends on them, it is not seen as the branch office of an MNC and it is not seen as the consulate office of a foreign state, even though that the Vatican is a state. Yeah. It's a member state of the UN. Yeah. But it is not seen like that. Because it can say it's done for God, they can get away with anything. So therefore, these MNCs are actually many different kinds of MNCs, not just uh, commercial corporate MNCs. Thank you. We have a question here. Good morning. Cheryl Scales, entrepreneur. I want to thank you both. Your comments were both uh, instructional. They were informative. They were really inspiring. So I want to also ask, uh, with the election of President Obama, uh, <laughs> oh, this is a both of you. Um, yes. Uh, do you believe, and if so, how do you believe his election 
uh, will uh, add value to your concept of uh, world peace and to uh, mutual respect, which I absolutely found fascinating. Uh, so I would love to hear your comments on those. Okay. Okay, fine. Uh, I really want Obama to succeed. I really, really want him to succeed. Uh, we all know the arguments from an American point of view, but what we don't know is the arguments from India's point of view, which is what I'd like to talk about. There is a lot of discussion in the Indian press that, you know, we need the Indian Obama. We need the Indian Obama. But they got it wrong. They got it wrong. They are naming politicians like Mayawati or like Karunanadi, people like that, uh, who are representing a faction, a minority, which has a chip on the shoulder, which is not speaking for the nation, which is not healing, which is not saying, we, I speak for all Indians. But Mayawati says, I speak for the Dalits, and they are victims of other people, and we got to hate them and bring them down in order that we come up. So th while the Indian press is saying, is Mayawati the Indian Obama, and is Karuna Nadi the Indian Obama, they are more like Louis Farrakhan and Malcolm X. because. <laughs> They, those guys had a chip on the shoulder approach to the nation. Obama did not run as a black. He ran as an American. He said, I, I just happen to be black, but the point is I'm the best candidate for the, the entire United States. Everybody, sh I'm, I'm, for everybody, I'm the best president. Now, the Indian minorities should learn from that. The Indian minority leaders should quit this minorityism and I need more quotas for my group and uh, fight other groups and all that, which is tearing the India, India apart into fragments. And the real, real moral of Obama that India should learn is that we need minorities who get beyond this chip on the shoulder, historical identity, conflict business, and speak for the entire nation. That kind of an Obama India doesn't have yet, and we need it very badly. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Poonam Bhatia and I have a comment and a question. Um, I'm uh, really delighted to hear uh, Rajiv Mahotras talk about the mutual respect, but I would like to add another dimension to that, is that um, we need to raise it to another level and include a very harmonious thoughts, words and actions. I think they're, they're disconnected right now, we say something and we do different things. And uh, the way you describe globalization is really based on VIFM, which I in my leadership forums talk to my bank employees, is that what it is for me. It's really a business dimension. We need to emphasize the commonality rather than the differences and different religious models because like you said, they're based on distorted history, convenience, uh, local identities, and maybe based on ego, that I'm better, my religion is better than yours. My question to you is, how do you plan or how do you communicate this to people of uh, the commonality of humanity? How we are common rather than how we are different? And how do you want to really communicate that and involve more people across the globe uh, in addition to the business and the profit motives that we all have? Thank you. Very good question. Uh, there's a rea reality uh, of difference. Uh, the, rea the, the principle of difference, uh, there's differences in plants. There's many kinds of plants, many kinds of oak trees, many kinds of roses, many colors. So the diversity is a principle of creation. That's the way the world is. It's diverse in all aspects of nature. The weather is different and no two days are identical. Nothing. No two human beings are identical. We don't, we don't have, we are different. So if you accept difference as the nature of reality and celebrate difference, you don't have to consider difference as a problem, but difference as, as reality that can be celebrated. Now, unfortunately, the trend has been to think of difference as a problem and to say, well, let's get rid of difference. So what has that achieved? One way that historically pe people dealt with difference was to genocide the other. Because if you eradicate them, then there's no difference left. There's nobody around. Another way was to enslave them and put them out of the way. 
then you know those who are different it can be apartheid or put out of the way. Another way was to convert them, saying, "Okay, I I'm anxious because you're different. You're different. I don't like it. It makes me insecure because you're something different about you. So rather than celebrating it, I want to convert you, make you like me. And by making you like me, I'm eradicating differences. So if you look at all the models that have been applied, they have been on the premise that difference is a problem to be solved." That is a very dangerous thing to say that difference is a problem only leads to these agendas and these campaigns to get rid of difference, and they all create result in violence. The Nazis wanted to get rid of the Jews because they were different. So this, uh, this, the Marxist sub approach is that difference should be turned into class conflict. You should get this guy and that guy conflicting, and you know something else will come. So that also is bad. The model that I would espouse is that rather than trying to pretend we are the same, why don't we say we actually celebrate our difference? We celebrate our difference. After all, we are able to do that with music. We celebrate difference. We don't say there's only one kind. We don't say there's only one kind of cuisine. We celebrate difference in cuisine. So if we can celebrate difference in areas of aesthetics, why can't we celebrate differences of identity, differences of spiritual worldviews? Why, why do we have to look for sameness? Uh, uh, in ways that may not work out in the end and may actually be an indirect way of uh, pressuring the other guy to be same like me. And then we have a lot of people trying to mimic the dominant culture, they want to become white. Indians becoming white is a very big phenomenon. I'm writing on that also. How I'm writing on white Indians, like the Red Indians, now there's white Indians who want to become white because it is, it is, it, it makes us less different. And we can say the highest demand for whitening cream is in India. In India. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's not only it's not only in the physical, but it's the body language. It's in the it's in the way of thinking, the the the, the discourse, the pursuit of the enlightenment model. It's all ways of sort of becoming kind of white in our way. And and I work with my African American academic friends. Uh, and we're going. I'm actually doing a joint book with an African American uh, person from Princeton University on uh, whiteness and Indians, particularly because Indians have this real obsession of uh, the concern about being different that has been put in them from the colonial times. So I actually would like to resist the pressure to uh, espouse that we're all the same. On the other hand, I'll go the other extreme and say we're all different, and we should celebrate that. That's my. My question is, what do you, for both of you, this escalation of uh, tension between Christianity and Muslims, we talk about Hindu unity, it's uh, wherever you go, oh, all Hindus must unite and core Sanatan Dharmi and all that. But the, and this concern is not just among us, but our, our younger generation too, my kids, and they all talk about it. How alarming is it? And is there anything being done about it? You go first. I have nothing to say. Really? Uh, you have a lot to say. Yes, well, uh, first of all, let me say, drawing on what he has already explained in detail, no Indian, if he's truly, correctly educated about the history of India, will feel any sense, any part of India is alien to him or different. In fact, uh, um, my mother used to tell me, and we are from the deepest south, namely Madurai, that because my Gotra is Kashyap, Therefore, Kashmir was created by my ancestors, so Kashmir belongs to us. So, I think the, similarly, people in South go to Varanasi for their ultimate uh, uh, salvation. People from North come to Ram, uh, to Ram Setu, Rameshwaram for the same. So, therefore, uh, as he very elaborately, and I'm looking forward to his book, I've uh, been saying to him to speed it up, but uh, obviously it's a difficult scholarship. India's unity is so deep that it's not possible really for an Indian to feel alienated from any part of it. 
I myself been elected twice from Bombay, in where every day some riot is going on. I came, I got elected from that constituency where none of my people are there. I mean, there are no Tamilians there. And uh, I've been elected twice from UP. It depends uh, on the projection. And I think uh, uh, that is the main thing that all of us have to realize. That while we celebrate our differences, uh, I think we, we Tamils are more intelligent than Punjabis. <laughs> that we celebrate. <laughs> so, uh, but within that framework, that sense of unity is there, should be practiced, and in times of crisis, Indians have demonstrated that. Now, the question of Christians and Muslims. That conflict is uh, actually doesn't impinge on us directly. The difference between uh, between a Hindu and Muslim and Hindu and Christian can be eliminated in very short time, minimized at least, if the Christians and Muslims were to acknowledge that their ancestors are Hindus, and therefore culturally we are the same people. Indian, Indian. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about Christians in India. The problem arises when they identify themselves with those who came from outside, which is factually not correct. The people who came from outside used Indian personnel to inflict the defeats and then take over. But the fact is that they, um, uh, they intermarried within the country and uh, therefore this lineage, this continuous, continuous civilization that Hindu civilization represents, is where all the religious groups belong to, and that's what the meaning of the word Hindustan. If that happens, I don't see any conflict between Hindus, Muslims, and Christians. The, the uh, Christian-Islamic conflict, because it's based on irreconcilable history, uh, will not be solved in our lifetime. It, 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 and, and if you are interested, I can tell you what is irreconcilable about their historical claims. That they do, for X to be legitimate, uh, they have to devalidate Y and vice versa. They cannot, on the surface, they can talk about everything being compatible. But the historicity requirements of X are incompatible with the historicity mandates and prerequisites of Y. That's in both directions. So this can only be solved if they dehistoric size, if they if they if they're willing to take that history with a grain of salt, uh, because there's no real evidence and proof of all that history. Uh, but right now, that is an internal fight within Christianity between the liberal Christians and the orthodox Christians, and the, and the fight within Islam between the clergy and the very very tiny, maybe two percent, who are liberal Muslims. So until these two groups are willing to get rid of that very historical absolute uh, interpretation, their problem cannot be solved. What it means for the non, uh, uh, what I call non-aggressive religions, the religions that don't proselytize, that don't claim that they have a universal answer for the whole world, that their mandate from God is to have market share, 100% market share, or expand their market share, that they are quite content with themselves and have enough problems of their own to solve, but not trying to go out and convert other people. Those kind of religions uh, are the battleground for both Christianity to expand and Islam to expand. There is a project called Joshua 1040. If you do a Google search, Joshua 1040. It's the world of association of all the proselytizing uh, Christian denominations who said that in the latitude 10 degrees to 40 degrees from north of the equator is the target for the next 100 years to Christianize. And then in that uh, window, India is the only country which allows it because China bans it and the Middle East Islamic countries ban it. So they've come up with very, very aggressive targets, uh, like by uh, five years from now they want uh, 100 million Christians and they've got quotas down to the district level and allocated and huge amount of money. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a war going on. By zip code? By zip code by, in, in India. So I actually, my book actually is on that, that this is a war going on and India is in the crosshair of this war. The Muslims is a different kind of an expansion or you know infiltration from Bangladesh and other kinds of demographic, more demographic kind of changes. So I feel that this uh, problem will uh, exacerbate the violence in India because of these uh, things that are happening. Comment on, uh, second point is comment on uh, Tamilians being smarter than Punjabis. <laughs> 
I see now hurt you. No. I, I, I'm actually going to uh, help you. <laughs> we have a, we have a, we have a varna system, which should not be called uh, caste. Uh, the four varnas are, are uh, skill centers. So there is a intellectual knowledge based skill center. Uh, that is the Brahmin. So today's uh, R&D people, college professors, they are Brahmins by the stand. It's not by birth in my way of thinking. Yeah. It's by skill center. Uh, people who are Kshatriyas are lawyers, government, government people, military people. So all the attorneys, all the lawmakers, all the military personnel, all the local cops, people who, whose skill is leadership, who can stand and command and who can negotiate, who can negotiate for my team versus your team or your group. So there is a Kshatriya pun also in sports. Sports is a kind of an outlet for Kshatriya pun to make teams and leaders. And this is how Americans teach their young boys how to be good Kshatriyas. So that's, a, that's the word now. Yeah, but the policy is to be made by Brahmins. Policy, policies, policies are the, yeah, certain kinds. Then the, the mesh, the, the Okay, let me let me complete. The Vashya, the Vashya is the corporate culture. The whole Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and all these guys, the Vashya are in trouble now because their market went down. So, so uh, uh, while the Kshatriyas have a lot to fight about with each other, you know, they're more fighting to do now. So this is the this is the intellectual this is the corporate ca uh, capital and the and the Shudras are hands-on people. Uh, the hands-on people, whether they're working with farms or whether they're doing your email or whether you're in a call center, the people who don't own, who don't own capital, because if you own capital, you are a Vashya. If you don't own capital, you are a worker. You're a hands-on guy. And so this is, America is a nation where, we, where Shudra are considered, where Shudra can become a very big shot because uh, from peanut farmer, you can be president or you can go and uh, launch a, launch a technology company and become very big. So the, the idea of of uh, four varnas is basically that a society needs these four skill centers, all of them very doing very well and in balance with each other, not not by inheritance and parentage, but by uh, by skill, by merit. Therefore, what I would say is that that whether that that the intelligence, first of all, if a certain group of people are more Brahmanically better off, and another group of people are more Kshatriya better off, and Vaishya better off as farmers, actually is very good for society because you need both of them. So this is actually the diversity message that diversity and difference is a good thing. You do need Shudras also, and you need to give them empowerment. It's only a problem if you kind of, uh, you know, a lot of the Shudras at one point in time were technology workers in India. They were the metallurgists, they were the surgeons, they were the farmers, and these people doing very well. And later their, their value went down because the product that they were making was not as valuable anymore. So it's like if today's tech bubble bursts, then you could say that the tech varna is poor. But that doesn't mean that the world is poor. They become poor. So these varnas have also competed and sometimes one of them is doing well, sometimes another one is doing well. So I don't think that there is anything uh, inferior in the Indian diversity model to not be a Brahmin, to be a Shudra and to, or to be a Kshatriya. So I, I don't take it as a problem at all. That, that, uh, because, because you see, the Vaishya can hire the Brahmin as his R&D in his R&D lab. <laughs> When I, when, I was, when I was running business as a Vashya, I'd hire a bunch of Brahmins as my r &D guys, and I'd hire a bunch of lawyers to be my Kshatriyas, yeah, and, and, and so on. And there's nothing absolutely wrong in that. Thank you. We have another question. My name is uh, Upendra I'm a member of the New Jersey General Assembly. When I was listening to you about um, the uh, where these religious uh, groups coming into India, converting people and all that. Isn't there a responsibility of the government to ensure economic egalitarianism? Because a lot of the times, he said, I think in a free society, there should be opportunity. There are opportunities to convert people here also. I have so many times uh, Jehovah Witnesses come to my door and drop off a uh, watchtower and all the things. And that is that's freedom, and that is really true democracy that you have to allow that. But uh, what has happened in that? If, if I am poor, if I am not able to make my ends and, and meet, and I don't have the education, I don't have the future, I don't have the hope to succeed, I am looking for people who are willing to provide that. 
if a Christ, Christian missionary comes and does that, or Islamic uh, uh, the religious people come and convert me, I mean, there is an, an obligation to the government to make sure all the people are provided the opportunity, irrespective of their race, religion, because that is what a secular society is all about. I think the government has failed in providing opportunities for these poor people, and uh, so they are looking for ways to uh, just to survive. I think uh, why uh, I, I disagree with your view, and I, what, maybe you can answer what is the role of government, why is not doing the economic egalitarianism, and uh, uh, after that is racial egalitarianism. Sure. I think uh, the question of freedom, uh, freedom also should have moral responsibility. Uh, we don't have unlimited freedom. Uh, we don't, the businesses don't have unlimited freedom. They can't do false advertising. Uh, if they do false advertising and make a claim for their product, which is false, they can get sued. But if I go there and make a claim that your religion will take you to hell, I can't really prove it. I can't really substantiate it. And my religion will sal give you salvation. I can't really, it's false advertising. I can't really substantiate it. But I can get away with it because it's religion. So if you want to apply the model of free marketing, then you should also apply the model of responsibility. Uh, you can you can take your competitor to task in the business model if he's giving you if he's doing unfair competition by slandering you. But can you take an, uh, the competing religion to task because he's slandering you? So the if you want freedom, so the first point is if you want a level playing field and a free market in religion, then you should also have religious accountability to the same standard as corporate accountability for them to get that same privilege. And that uh, requires also disclosure, transparency of disclosure, just like the corporate people have. So where does your money come from? What do you do with it? Are you ethical? Are you unethical in the way you are practicing? So this is as far as freedom is concerned. Second point is that, the, the, that basically what you're saying is, the very common argument, that if there are poor people, then I should be able to exploit them because I'm free, I, I'm free to, I'm making an offer and they don't have to accept the offer. But that's how you can also get people roped into drugs, you can get people roped into slavery, you can get people roped into prostitution, and you can say this is a free market, and I'm making this offer, and they are not forcing, I'm not forcing it on them, but they're accepting it because they're too poor, and it's the government's fault, fault for not giving them enough economic uh, opportunity, so they, I'm, I, they can be my, I can victimize them. So I feel that unfair exploitation by first world churches in the third world, using their poverty against them is immoral. And, the re and another point is, you can blame it on those governments for, for having poverty, but they, are, they have a colonial history. They are already doing at 5, 6, 8, 9 percent GDP. It's probably the fastest they can grow. And even growing at this rate, it will probably take them 100 years to get out of poverty. So it is not like they started like the first world. The first world captured and conquered a large amount of land. I mean, the church went around North South America, took over all this land, and you know what the history of that is. And the reason they have all this money is not because it ra rained from the sky, but because they were they were into ra radical, violent evangelism, and they took over so much land. So for them to say, okay, you know, now we are rich, and so you guys are poor, and so you know we can pray on you, is not morally right. A few facts I will give you. In India, the largest owner of real estate after the government is the church. You don't know, these people are not known. Now they didn't, they didn't buy the land at fair market price. A um, lot of it was British entitlement. During the British times, they gave a whole lot of land grants to the churches. Where you see the churches built in premium land and the cemeteries in premium land, and the church schools were in premium land. They did not buy it at fair market price. They were given that. So if you want fairness, and if you're saying that the, they got more money, so they should be allowed to do all this, well, where did they get this money from? Did they really get it by equitable, fair, honest means, or did they plunder it, and did they get it from uh, colonial governments? And the answer is yes, yes, and yes. So I feel that you have to uh, allow freedom of religion in the sense of balanced with a responsibility to be ethical in your claims, how you are marketing, not exploit poor people, uh, not uh, be into hate speech, that divides people, uh, and the honorable thing for the church in India would be that they should return all the land, 
um, beyond their proportion. If the two and a half percent of India's population is Christian, then only two and a half percent of all the religious land should be owned by churches. The rest of it, they should say, we're very honest, we'll return it back because we're very honorable and moral people. If they're not willing to do that, then this business that, oh, you know, we believe in freedom, and since you're poor, your government cannot solve your problem, therefore I have a right to ram road through, road, uh, you know, ram through this and do by whatever hook or crook I can, is actually a, a big anti, uh, it's very immoral and also against the principles of Christianity, as I understand Christianity. May, may I add one thing? Sure. <laughs> may, may I add one thing? In India, the conversion activities are not done by Indian Christians. Most of the established churches, say the city of church and so on, they don't do any conversion activities at all. In fact, they even make statements to say that this is wrong. But it's really the foreign funded. And very often people who are in trouble with the law here, there was a massive rally uh, for conversion conducted by a man called Benny Hinn. And he's in trouble with the law here. But the government of the day provided him the Indian Air Force ground because he had mobilized a million people to attend his uh, congregation. And there he had 12 people climb on the stage, one paralytic, one cancer, uh, one blind, etc. And he put his hand on each one of them and all got cured. And later on, uh, the Bangalore police, where it was held, uh, revealed that these 12 were actually brought from Tamil Nadu and they were given training on how to behave like a cancer patient and how to behave like a blind, etc. This kind of is repeated all over the country. There's another John Watts who's been doing the same thing. So in, invariably, we find that the conversion activities at the, at the, at the wholesale level is carried out on the basis of foreign money and by foreign missionaries and not by the Indian Christian uh, churches. One other point to this, if Christianity by converting people over in the poor country can solve their problems, they should first solve them in Africa where they already converted them, in Latin America where they already converted them, in Mexico and all these places. Philippines is an Asian country which is mostly Christian. They should demonstrate uh, that they have they, they, their solution works before they export it further. And uh, they should take it. They should take their solution to downtown Trenton, where it's mostly Christian people, but they're very poor. Uh, they should. They should. You, you cannot. If the if the physician is himself uh, taking that medicine and is sick, he's got really no right to go on selling it to other people. So they have to do market testing. They should say we have test market. One is Trenton and other inner cities. One is Philippines. One is Mexico. One is African countries where we've converted them. And our program for the next 50 years is to really get rid of poverty and get rid of social abuse and get rid of single moms and drug addiction. All these things we want to get rid of them. Then we will go to the world and say, ah, we can solve the problem. And if they can do that, I will also champion Christianity. But until they can do that, I'm sorry, they haven't proven that their solution works. I have a question. I have a question from India. No, 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 I have one question. No, no, are, you talking to, are you talking to Christianity or are you talking to Christianity? Andrew, you can, can you please... We came here to talk about globalization. It looks like you are attacking Christianity here. Being a Christian from India, born Christian from India, I think you are not tolerant to Christianity and I refuse to uh, uh, agree with you. And the caste system in India created Aryans and Dravidians and Dalits and all those things, you try to blame it on the Americans. And the Americans have helped India get democracy after the Second World War when, uh, when British refused to give democracy, uh, independence to India. American government is the one who forced it, uh, the British government, Chamberlain, uh, Prime Minister Chamberlain to give democracy. So we came here for listen to globalization. Not your intolerance to Christianity. That's all. Andrew, you have a rightly opinion, and yeah, we are having a discussion here. No, I think it's a it's a good question. But one thing I would like to tell you is that uh, the Christian Church produced reports in India saying that they have they have failed to solve the caste problem within the church itself. They have separate cemeteries for Dalit Christians and Brahmin Christians in many states. They have, I, can, I can show you books written by the church saying that we still have a Dalit Christian problem in India. And if you go to Google Dalit Christian, 
you will get Dalit Christian websites where they are filing lawsuits in India against the church for being caste biased, even in India. And if you want to talk about caste problems in Christianity, you go to Philippines. They have a hierarchy of uh, Christian, uh, different kinds of hierarchy. You look at the um, United States of America, blacks church are separate worshipping than whites. Hispanics are separate, Koreans are separate, Indian church is separate. So you have segregation even in the richest country in this country within Christianity itself. So, you know, it's easy to all blame on others, but I'm saying physician, heal thyself. Christian society needs to become a world model because all the wealth it has and all the land it has and it has had a thousand years to do it and unless it can solve the problem internally, its export model has to be questioned. So I have a right as, a, as somebody that they're constantly dumping on me, trying to pressure me to, uh, as a consumer, there are consumer rights. And so we as consumers of spiritual and religious propaganda around the world have a right to say, hey listen, this particular supplier is selling us something which he hasn't proven works. That's all I'm saying. And so in globalization, there is all kinds of people who are globalizing. We can also criticize many kinds of other globalization models. Christianity is not the only one I talked about. It's the one that you guys picked on. I talked about uh, whether it's Al-Qaeda, whether it's Islam, whether it's irresponsible multinationals, whether it's diseases, whatever it is, there's globalization of many, many kinds that are going on. And I think we talked about all of them. Thank you, Ravi. Hello, my name is Ashok Hoda and uh, I'm a journalist and I'm uh, very happy to be here because this is an interesting topic. I don't really come across in community events which I cover all the time. Uh, I have been a student of sociology and uh, I'm proud of my ancestry of being Hindu and uh, our religious ancestors who gave us uh, Bhagavad Gita and uh, Veda and Upanishad. But I also know that um, uh, when I came here, uh, there was not much education given to me back home in India about my own uh, uh, you know, proud history and literature. And I learned here how uh, grand our architect, how grand is our <laughs> from the scholars uh, in Western countries who wrote about uh, uh, Indian achievements. And I know that if you Google uh, Bhagavad Gita, you'll find 25,000 translations uh, done here uh, in the Western countries. <coughs> and it's taught in the textbooks, uh, as Dr. Soy may testify. Uh, I am really enlightened to hear a very different perspective on globalization and also war and peace. However, uh, in this discourse, a uh, number of things are missing and uh, I would like to connect with the concern that uh, Andrew uh, put forward and also our friend uh, Upendraji has brought to us. Uh, India has been free for 60 years and um, you reminded us that uh, there is a real danger of um, majority, multinational so-called religion uh, transforming and converting uh, people, uh, which is nothing new. And when I was a child, um, I mean youngster, I wanted to go to a college and I, I come from a Brahmin family and I had no help. My father was a teacher and uh, one thing that I was told is there is a college in Ranchi in Bihar that's called St. Javier's College. St. Javier's College was the best college in, in, that, in that part of the world which was giving uh, direct uh, uh, education upliftment to travel people. When I went there, that, by the way, St. Javier's College, gave, I'm just giving an example, the role of non-Hindus in developing our own culture. Uh, Father Kamil Bulke from uh, Belgium, he has been lifelong uh, worker, missionary in India, and he wrote the best dictionary from English to Hindi. And when I went to St. Jeeva's College, I found Father Kamil Bulke talking to a tribal boy who didn't know English. And I went to other colleges, Saint Patna Science College, other colleges. It was so hard to find a teacher who might be Hindu to talk to me. Nobody was addressing me what the problems are. Uh, and I'm making this point here is that it's easy to, to say that uh, they are going to Nagaland trying to change the uh, state into a nation. I know Bill Graham, I know Ivan in this country, I know Pat Robertson who um, gave a fatwa to kill uh, Chavez and it's all done here, people know that and this country allows but we also know that it's all wrong. We have learned in this country the value of freedom of religion, we also have learned uh, importance of diversity. 
which is really missing in the educational and political discourse in Europe, in our country, I mean, yes. uh, my native country, in India. And we also know how the politics, the democracy, has been misused by leaders like Mayawati. And uh, as uh, our first Bansuji talked about <coughs> Dr. Swami, that uh, when he was a young, he was the only icon for young uh, intellectuals like me in the college, and we really look forward and we missed you coming further up in the, in the comments, <laughs> I would say. So the point I'm trying to make, I'm sorry, let me come to the question. My question is this, <clears throat> don't you think that uh, the, the system which you have adopted in India has been really responsible to keep a vast portion of people aside and also that the question of the Maoist insurgency is far much more greater than the religious uh, missionaries, uh, yeah, which is increasing all over, and there is no real concern to face that. And how do you face that? Because you have to ch check the poverty problem. Yeah, I think uh, the first question is uh, on the history of Indian education. Uh, there are two very important uh, works that you should look at. One is uh, Macaulay. Everybody, a lot of people here know about Macaulay who made uh, speeches in the 1830s in the British Parliament saying that the only way to break the back of these people is to deny them uh, uh, education uh, in their traditional way. And we have to bring in uh, English style, British style education to build an army of civil servants who will be, who will be looking, uh, who will be brown people but uh, in, in looking up to the whites, looking up to us as superior people, subservient to build a whole class of uh, civil servants to work for the British. Uh, you look on the history of Macaulay and the whole movement to change India's education system began. And that education system was to create babus, people who can't think for themselves, people who just basically uh, be subservient and uh, not creative and imaginative and this whole idea of, uh, of a fixed syllabus and an exam where you mug up and you pass and you don't learn to think for yourself. This was adopted at that, from, started from that time. And after independence, the Indian government, Gandhi had a different model. Gandhi wanted to go back to the traditional Indian model and go back to empowerment of villages. And it was Nehruvian competing model which won, which was to bring more Fabian socialism from England and British European style into the education system. So actually after uh, the uh, independence of India, India didn't go back to its traditional roots to uh, change its education system, but made it even more Europeanized. There was a man called Dharampal, who was uh, one of the last remaining Gandhians, he just died uh, two years ago. And he wrote a very good book called uh, The Beautiful Tree. If you search that, The Beautiful Tree by Dharampal, he gives you the history of what happened in the 1800s to India's education system using British records. So the British uh, sent people every 10 years to do a survey on uh, Indian education and how well is our re-engineering and doctoring of that system doing. And the British themselves remarked that one of the impacts of their education system is that now there is less diversity, there is more people who are just coming to become babus, and the, people, the, the relevance of education to the poor person or the artisan is not there like it used to be in the traditional Gurukul system. So this, this uh, shift in education has about a 150 year, almost 200 year history, which is important to understand. So the education system as it is in India, if you compare the history textbooks of India with the history textbooks of United States, for example, or China, or Russia, or France, I, and I do that, I, have, I can give you reports where we're comparing, we're fighting California textbook bias, New Jersey textbook bias, uh, Seema started a commission on Asian studies and put me on that, just to do that for New Jersey textbooks. You will find that the most textbooks of these other countries have a tremendous uh, uh, history of the greatness of their forefathers. Uh, the French will tell you about this France, greatness of France, and the Chinese will tell you about the Confucian heritage, and the America is about founding fathers and how great we are, and uh, the Enlightenment movement and our technology. So the idea, if you talk to an educationist, they'll tell you that in college you can do all the critical analysis you want, but in the young days when you are, in the early years when you're learning your identity and how to be a good responsible citizen, you must first of all feel proud as a citizen. You must be proud of your nation you belong to and the society you belong to. So in the formative years, you want to give them a good solid grounding which is very patriotic. And there's a lot that educationists have written 
uh, on the importance of teaching a positive American history to our young people. And Carnegie, who started all the libraries, the great Carnegie who started the Carnegie Endowment, the philanthropist, he started, when he started the public library system, he gave endowments to towns to start a library and he donated them. In that in the charter, he said the primary function should be that the public should be able to go to their local library and read the greatness of the country. And they, there should be a lot of books on history and our presidents and our wars and all that kind of stuff. So now this is lacking in India. There is almost a, almost a kind of an abuse of the nation. You will find uh, still Gandhi is great and Gandhi's greatness is mentioned. But you will find a very mixed up account of Indian history in Indian textbooks. This is, this is, uh, and this is why people who are products of the Indian education system are very mixed up about our own sense of history and our, we are not taught a whole lot about our own culture and our own tradition. The way in most other countries there is a lot of emphasis on teaching you that. So this problem that you mentioned is an absolutely serious problem. This is a very true problem, it's a very serious problem, there's a history to it, but we don't want to just sit here and blame the past, we have to now do something about it. So this is where uh, probably if I were, if I were to influence one, uh, one branch of government, if I could, I, it would be the HRD ministry. Because the HRD ministry lays the foundation for education. I wrote that we should in include yoga in K-12 through in India rejected by the HRD because we are secular. Can you believe that yoga is considered a violation of secularism in India? It is. It is. You, you, will, you will find a lot of people complaining that, you know, oh, yoga comes, God, no, forbid, they might say, Om, who knows, we're not supposed to say that. I mean, you have all that stuff, real hang-ups about who we are in India. So, to bring yoga into India, I've been organizing conferences bringing Americans to India to talk about yoga. Because then the Indians will clap and say, wow, big much very, very. I, I did a, uh, I, there was a, there was an IIT Kharagpur 50th anniversary and they asked for a grant to do a conference and, uh, and, I, and the, the, grant, the conference they were going to do was on mind science. When I looked at the schedule of speakers and the topics, it was all about Western models of science, Western models of mind, Freud and this and that and models of mind. So I wrote back to them saying that I'll be happy to fund the conference, but at least one panel should be on Indian models of mind. And the answer I got was, oh, we are not chauvinist, we are not saffron. That was the answer I got. So I got five white guys. I got five white guys who were real solid, uh, like you said, so many people have written about Gita in this country. I got five of those guys and said, you know, this is your chance to pay back to the mother country from which you got all this knowledge. And what you must do is go to talk to the Indians about their own culture, why it means a lot to you, how you are teaching it in Colombia, how you are teaching it in Cambridge, and give them a sense that it's okay. And so we gave them a grant, and they went to IIT Kharagpur, and they got standing ovations because now it's white guys saying good things about them. <laughs> this is called the pizza effect. Pizza effect is, you know, pizza was a poor man's diet in Italy. The rich and upper class were ashamed to have pizza because something like the Hathis, you know, villages and pumpkins they eat. Until Pizza Hut turned it into global cuisine, kind of global now thing, you know. So the Italians were very proud, you know, our pizza everywhere now. Now, now you can be kind of into pizza, you can have a pizza in Italy. So this idea of inferiority complex about your own culture, which gets remedied when the dominant world culture brings it back to you, this is known as pizza effect. So one of the ways I'm working to try and bring back traditional knowledge into India is getting white guys to go help me do that. And it, it works. You, uh, when a white guy, when we bring three, four white speakers to talk about Indian philosophy and Gita, you can get it, even you can get into a place like Gia and you. And they will accept the guy to speak there. And then they will applaud also. He's very happy because he said it. So this complex is very deep in our country. No, I, I think it should be made clear to him, Mr. Jocha, that no one, neither of us, rather, talked about barring foreign scholars, nor uh, failing to appreciate the deep research done by them. This country welcomes Indian scholars, we welcome foreign scholars. The issue was different. The issue was the inducement to, uh, to convert. And that, as he mentioned, was an official policy adopted during the British period. It, uh, it's not Macaulay, just somebody who wrote something. 
he was uh, officially in charge. He minuted it. It was presented laid on the table of the House of the House of Commons. So, therefore, in uh, the in in a nutshell, when the foreign missionary comes to convert, there is it's not a level playing field. You can't equate a foreign missionary with a government uh, competing with them because their their activities is funded by resources from abroad. And Pat Robertson had said when he said 100 million in India to be converted in in a decade or less than that, he said resources no no concern. And if you just go to the Home Ministry and get a from the uh, on the right to information, the money that is coming to foreign Krishna missionary organization working in India. You will find the amount staggering, 400 crores, 500 crores a year. In fact, some people say it's more. So I, I think that all, if, if it's a level playing field, we have no problem. In fact, I will say, despite all that, the amount of conversion that has actually taken place is very small. The activity is very large. And that doesn't mean that just because the effect is, the conversion rate has been small, there has been resistance. After all, for 800 years the Muslims ruled India with the utmost brutality. Then 200 years of Christian rule, still India is 83% Hindu. So I, I think that now in a free India, uh, conversion is not going to be that large. Perhaps it, if at all there is any change in demography, it will be from infiltration and the differential growth of rate of population. These are the only two ways in which the ratios can change. Nevertheless, this activity is not a fair activity and therefore we are against it. It's not a question of being against Christianity, it's not being against foreigners coming to India. It's a question of an activity directed where it is not required. Thank you so much. Now we have questions here. We have a question here and I'm going to take one more in the interest of time. Um, and then, you know, the, uh, the speakers are going to be here. Mr. Roger, we are really ready now. Okay, I'm sorry. I have a question here, and we have one more there, and then we are going to break for lunch, and uh, they're going to be around. I really come on to comment about uh, the Christianity, but I think we're running out of time. My question is that, in terms of Mr. Joe Biden, what do you think about India's relation with the U.S.? That he made quite a few comments against India, and there is still remarks also future. Well, I think uh, what will happen after they take office is going to, is anybody's guess and whatever comments may have been made uh, during electioneering and in the past, uh, people generally when they are not in power say certain things and when they get in power then there's a new realism. I, I think there'll be some surprises pleasantly for India, some surprises unpleasantly for India. Uh, I, I really don't uh, know. I mean, I'd like to wait and see what their policies are, uh, and then we can we can discuss what they do. I, I mean, the one I'm most concerned about. I want to look at uh, faith-based initiatives of where the United States government funds overseas evangelism in the name of bringing them human rights and in the name of bringing them food and medicine and education. But in fact, that is really an agenda for proselytizing. There was a 2004 or 2006 Wall Street Journal article, very interesting article, on foreign evangelism as US foreign policy. US foreign policy, foreign evangelism. Why it is, what's the history of it for a long time, and so on. So I'd like to see if Obama will change that and say we should decouple ourselves. And this business of separation of church and state, which is uh, the law in the United States, we should also espouse it overseas and not be coupled with overseas evangelism, just like we are not coupled with domestic evangelism. That remains to be seen. Actually, something that really impacted me was the recognition of the different intelligences. I deal with them, the in and the out, and the recognition of it. Uh, globalization, as I see it, truly begins at home. And when I say home, I'm not saying a country. I'm saying our home, our house, our heart. How can we take it, really take it global? And the most important thing along those lines is the emphasis that we make in our own children. Okay, you brought an A, you are a success. How about asking, do you get along with your classmates? Are you, have, you, have you been 
uh, morally? Have, are you somebody that have gotten an A plus? Are you, what have you done for your fellow human being? Are you recognizing the differences between your classmates? At that point, we could truly say we are leaning toward global equality and globalization. There is a website, Taking It Global, that actually is a forum for young people, and I truly challenge everyone just to visit this site and recommend it to your children. Remember, we are, have to be the change we want to see in the world. Thank you. Thank you. What can we do to instill that? Is that well, I, she has answered my question. Uh, teach everybody the five intelligences and you will have a new global uh, citizen. Uh, that's what we need. Uh, not only to develop your cognitive intelligence, but the other intelligences also. That's what you need to we do. We have one last question. And Pam, do you have a question? You're done? Okay. Uh, you know, you guys mentioned it. Everybody knows it. We just had a very interesting election in the United States. I guess a nation's uh, nightmare is almost over. You know, we'll have a new president in uh, just over uh, two months. And I think uh, the a lot of the solutions that we are talking about here, I think, comes from the fact that a lot of the words were uttered by one man not too long ago. Mahatma Gandhi. And I think a lot of the approaches that I see to the problems uh, of Obama, I think they resemble uh, the approaches that Mahatma Gandhi took in his own time. It was uh, Ahimsa, where it was Satyagraha, where it was just simple uh, Gandhi march. You know, just the different thinking, how to, uh, uh, how to uh, solve any problem. And I think Obama has done, the same, has done uh, the same thing, or at least trying to do the same thing. When he was talking about the race issue in the United States, he didn't just duck it. He just didn't say, you know, well, let's just talk and things. He actually talked about it in a way that nobody else had done um, in the last 60 years, at least. Not maybe since uh, Frederick Douglass, uh, which was more than a century ago. And I think, uh, the country and the world has a great hope right now uh, in Obama. And I think um, given the chance, given the opportunity, and given the cooperation of the people of America and the people of the world, I think uh, the world will see a better day. That's what I want to thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming this morning. I want to thank our phenomenal panelists, Dr. Subramaniam Swami. Thank you so much for rearranging your schedule and for being here from India just for this um, event of ours. And Rajiv Malhotra, a great friend, thank you so much. It was wonderful. And I'm sure all of you enjoyed this timely and very, very important discussion here this morning. Yeah. We have a little token of our appreciation for both of our speakers. I'd like to invite Anil Bansal to join me when we present it to both of them.